Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another episode of Creation Magazine Live, the show put out by Creation Ministries International Canada. In this one, they explain why the complexity of DNA indicates that it was designed. Just never mind the fact that complexity is actually indicative of bad design. Something that is well designed will only be as complex as is absolutely necessary to complete its task. Adding extra complexity makes the design worse. So to use the analogy they're inevitably going to use themselves, if I write a simple hello world code in Python, for the goal of displaying the specific message hello world, the best way to accomplish that with the least amount of complexity is to simply use the print command with one line of code that says to print that exact text. Now, the same thing could be accomplished with a variable and a loop where the text hello world is stored in a variable and then printed out character by character. The end result is exactly the same, you get a text that says hello world on the screen. But the loop is more complex and will use more resources while it runs than the simpler version, and so it is less efficient in accomplishing the same task. Now sure, an argument could be made here that it is good practice to store things in variables, that way if you ever need to revisit your code to change it for whatever reason, you only need to change it in one place rather than having to hunt down every instance of it individually, but this has two problems. First, we are just looking at the purpose of the code, and for the hello world example, we know that we're never going to need more than that, so the variable adds a layer of complexity that, while not inherently bad, is unnecessary. Second, even if we agree that using a variable is a best practice, having it display character by character in a loop has no such justification and only serves to use more resources to accomplish the same task. So with that out of the way, even though I'm sure we're going to revisit it, let's take a look! Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Thomas Bailey. Um, it's been a while since I've watched any of these. When did Richard start cosplaying as Jim Carrey with his old man beard? DNA, by the way, is an instruction code for how to build and operate a living thing. All living things have DNA. Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft, made this statement back in 1995. He wrote, human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. And who better to explain the intricacies of complex biochemical systems than a computer nerd? Of course, if you ask people like John Parrington, Associate Professor of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology at Oxford University, or David Moore, developmental psychologist who researches behavioral epigenetics, they'll tell you that the computer code analogy for DNA is incredibly oversimplified. DNA is a chemical compound. It works through chemical interactions in the cell. If there are two cells with identical DNA, but different chemical compounds within the cells, the DNA, though identical, will behave differently. This is why your eyes and your liver can both have cells with identical DNA, but wind up performing vastly different functions from each other. And even within these contained cells, the chemistry of the surrounding cells can also change how the DNA is expressed. And on top of all of that, in chemical systems that have as many different components as modern cells do, there is always the chance that something will go wrong in a chemical reaction. And when I say go wrong here, I'm simply referring to a reaction having results that we wouldn't necessarily expect given the conditions of the cell, rather than there actually being an intention behind the reactions themselves. With computer code, barring the presence of something like a virus, it doesn't matter what else is going on in the computer, running the hello world python script will always produce the same result, a window that says hello world. Now we could stretch the analogy on the programming side by pointing out that there are platform differences that matter for programming, where the same code won't work in the same way on a Linux system as it will on Windows, Android, iOS, or anything else, but even then it's not really comparable. You won't get a program that will be a word processor on one operating system, an original Angry Birds game on another, and a video editor on a third. So yeah, comparing DNA to computer code is useful for gaining a very rudimentary understanding of how it works, but the analogy just doesn't hold up when you get into even some of the basic details of how DNA actually works. Let's crank the clock back to 1859, long before Bill Gates, when Charles Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species. Now the thinking back then was that the cell was a fairly simple blob of matter. 
it's easier to imagine organisms evolving slowly and gradually if they're fairly simple. Right. Well, that's actually kind of the main thing with evolution. Regardless of how complex modern life may be, it did evolve from simpler life. The fossil record bears this out. Older organisms tended to be simpler and more generalized, but each time an organism adapted to a change in its environment, it became slightly more specialized to live in the changed environment, with greater complexity being a side effect of such specialization. And then there's also the fact that life appears to be a byproduct of the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is the one that says that in a closed system, the total entropy of that system will increase over time. Entropy being a measurement of how much energy is available in the system that is capable of doing work, in the physics sense. The more energy that's available, the lower the entropy, and vice versa. So as time goes on, there will be less energy available for work in the system. The way this plays out in reality is that systems will spontaneously form which increase entropy faster than if those systems were not there. To borrow an analogy from the excellent American Scientist article on this topic, it's like water on top of a hill. Gravity acts as the second law of thermodynamics in this analogy, with water being the amount of energy in the system that can do work. The higher up the water is, the lower the entropy of the system. Gravity is pulling the water down the hill, but it ultimately is indifferent to what path it will take. As the water flows, it will carve out a channel, and as the channel is carved, the water that follows the initial part of the flow will deepen and strengthen that channel. The channel is life in this analogy. The specifics of the channel are dependent on the topography of the hill. It will be winding in some places, straight in others, sometimes deep and narrow, sometimes wide and shallow. But as the water flows, it continually erodes out bits that will strengthen the channel, allowing easier passage of the water that is still above it. So in this analogy, we can see that as long as the hill isn't perfectly smooth and thus causing the water to flow in all directions equally, the formation of a channel is a physical inevitability. It's the same with life. Life is one of the channels which serves to increase the flow of entropy. And just as a channel on top of a hill can increase in complexity over time to become a system of rivers, so too will life increase in complexity over time in order to satisfy the second law's requirements that entropy should increase. And when it comes down to it, the origin of life could just be the result of a chemical reaction that occurs slowly in the absence of life. So for instance, the reaction where carbon dioxide and hydrogen combine to form water and acetate. Without life, this is a slow reaction, but part of the metabolism of all known living things is a relatively simple set of reactions called the citric acid cycle. In modern organisms, this usually involves oxygen that wouldn't have been available on the early Earth, but in some anaerobic organisms, they use the reductive mode of the cycle, which, with the help of an energy source, combines the carbon dioxide and water to output more complex molecules. This has the effect of allowing high energy electrons to more rapidly reach a low energy state, water flowing down the metaphorical hill. And this is an excellent candidate for the potential origin of life, as one form or another of the citric cycle is the starting point of every biosynthetic pathway. All life shares this basic metabolic reaction, and it is a very simple reaction that could very plausibly begin spontaneously on the prebiotic, but very chemically active, Earth. And as this cycle is, at its core, simply electrons seeking lower energy states, and this cycle is essentially the basis for all metabolic processes, then, as the discoverer of the citric acid cycle, Albert St. Georgi, once observed, life is nothing but an electron looking for a place to rest. Seriously, the article that I got most of this from is amazing. If you are at all interested in the chemical origins of life, go and give it a read. It's called The Origin of Life, A Case is Made for the Descent of Electrons. Link is in the description. We now know that there are problems with that view. <laughs> Darwin didn't know anything about genetics, which really took off shortly after he published. There was a lot that Darwin didn't know about biology. You could fill entire scientific journals with stuff that Darwin didn't know about biology. In fact, that has been done. And despite this, nearly 100% of scientists agree that evolution is real. Whether or not Darwin was aware of something is completely irrelevant to our modern understanding of biology. But I guess that's hard for apologists to wrap their heads around, given that the cutting edge arguments for the existence of God come from people like Aquinas, who lived 750 years ago. And he basically copied the ancient Greek philosophers, but put a Christian spin on their arguments. So the cutting edge arguments for God's existence are actually about 2,500 years old, give or take a century or two. He did, however, famously admit, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. 
And true to creationist form, you've truncated the quote, leaving out some pretty important context. To continue it from immediately after they ended it, but I can find no such case. No doubt many organs exist of which we do not know the transitional grades, more especially if we look to much isolated species round which, according to my theory, there has been much extinction. Then he goes on for a bit giving more specific examples of times when it would be hard to discover the evolutionary origin of such an organ, before saying, we should be extremely cautious in concluding including that an organ could not have been formed by transitional gradations of some kind, numerous cases could be given amongst the lower animals of the same organ performing at the same time wholly distinct functions. And then he goes on to give numerous examples of times when this is the case, pointing out that, should selection ever push that organ in the direction of one function over the other, it could have the appearance of not having been formed by slight modifications without that actually being the case. Darwin wrote in a way that was very conciliatory towards people who might disagree with evolution, while still explaining why he thought that they were wrong. So he would start by pointing out a perceived flaw in evolution, along with some statements meant to show that such a perception is perfectly reasonable. Then he would follow that up with a very thorough explanation as to why that perception is wrong. And in most cases, his follow-up has withstood the test of time. An organ having a different function in the past is still the correct answer to Michael Behe's irreducible complexity argument. For example, biochemist Michael Behe coined the term irreducible complexity. Well, speak of the devil. Now that refers to a system of interacting parts in which every part has to be in place before it can function. Now this means that a system couldn't come into being gradually bit by bit, and there are many examples of this kind of evolution-refuting design in molecular biology. There just aren't any that don't require you to ignore most of the literature on their evolutionary development in order to get you there. Here's an example. Life depends on an incredible enzyme called ATP synthase. That's the name of the world's tiniest rotary motor, rotating at up to 7,000 RPM. These are so small that 100,000 would fit side by side in a millimeter. Okay, they go on for a while marveling at how small it is and how many of them there are in our bodies and how quickly they work. Because when you don't actually have data on your side, you have to try and get people to say, wow, that's a lot. All while hoping that the following thought is something along the lines of, there's no way that could happen naturally. But the whole thing is irrelevant. Being able to make a lot of a thing does not mean that the initial evolution of that thing was impossible. In fact, if you saw that animation and thought to yourself, hang on, that looks a lot like the flagellar motor that be he was flagellated with in court, where he claimed that there was no evolutionary explanation, despite the fact that there are several plausible evolutionary pathways, then congratulations! You've noticed that they're pivoting away from that very well-known example to another very similar structure that serves a different purpose, and both of which seem to have evolved from similar precursor molecules. And since there is a 2007 paper that explains the potential evolutionary origin from simpler molecular machines that serve slightly different functions, while also explaining how this evolutionary pathway could have led to flagellar motors as well, and that there are plenty of other papers on this exact subject that either propose alternate evolutionary pathways or build on previously proposed pathways, I'm going to go ahead and call bullshit on the idea that ATP synthase is irreducibly complex. But that aside, the main issue that I have with irreducible complexity is that it's a mislabel. Creationists will often use the analogy of a mousetrap to explain it. A mousetrap with five parts cannot be reduced any further without losing its function. Which isn't quite true. There's a whole page on the University of Delaware website showing hypothetical mousetraps made out of the same parts as a typical mousetrap, but without what would be thought of as key pieces of the trap. And there's also the tie clip example that Dr. Miller used when he testified in the Kitzmiller vs. Dover trial. He used a mousetrap that was missing a few parts as a tie clip, showing that while it wouldn't make a very good mousetrap in that form, it could still serve a different function, and that's analogous to how evolution works. It will take something that serves one function and slightly modify it before repurposing it for a different function. That is what appears to be the case for both the flagellar motor and ATP synthase. They appear to be modified versions of a type 3 secretion system. Anyway, back to my main issue, which I seem to have lost track of here. Complex systems are way more likely to still be able to function with missing parts than simple systems, and the more complex a system is, the more likely it is that simpler versions of that system would not only still work, but could work in different ways, serving different functions. 
The mousetrap is a simple system, not a complex one. ATP synthase is a complex system. It is made up of two distinct protein entities. One of those entities is made up of nine subunits, the other is made up of six subunits, with additional subunits that aren't necessarily a part of either protein entity still being associated with the molecule. We also recognize components of ATP synthase in other molecules that perform different functions, like the aforementioned type 3 secretion system, which is also closely related to the flagellar motor. So what creationists should really be looking for here is not an irreducible complex system, but an irreducibly simple one. A system that is made up of so few individual parts that when you remove one of the parts, it couldn't possibly function for anything. The problem they'd run into here, though, would be that such a system would be rather easy to assemble through nothing more than random chemical interactions. After all, the Earth has always been a chemically rich place, with all sorts of chemicals just bopping around all over the place. So if you find some biological system that gets down to a mere five parts like the mousetrap, then it becomes significantly more likely that you'll be able to find those five parts on their own in nature. And it will likely be quite plausible that on the chemically muddled Earth, those five parts could easily come together through nothing more than random interactions. ATP is vital for life, and many of these motors were needed before the first living cell could exist. You mean it's vital for modern life. This is a thing that creationists do all the time. They'll look at a modern cell, see how complicated it is, and then declare that there is no way that such a thing could have formed spontaneously on the prebiotic Earth. And they're right. There is no way that a modern cell with all its various complicated bits could have formed on its own on the prebiotic Earth. Which is why that's not a thing that anyone thinks happened. The first cell would have been something much, much simpler. Something more along the lines of the types of protocells that Martin Hanchik has shown form rather easily in the right chemical environments, many of which would have existed on the early Earth. With these cells being capable of things like moving, seeking out food sources, and even reproducing in a very life-adjacent way, but while still being obviously not alive. DNA is the most compact information storage system in the universe. You know, it always kind of amazes me when people are willing to make such absolute statements like that. Not only is it impossible to say what other molecules may have developed elsewhere in the universe that might have a data density that rivals that of DNA, but with just a tiny bit of searching, I found pretty quickly that researchers at IBM were able to store bits in single atoms of holmium. And while I'm fairly certain that using DNA as a data storage molecule will probably reach commercial viability sooner than holmium atoms, the fact that it was done in the first place means that no, DNA is not the most compact information storage system in the universe. Single atoms are. Or rather, they are the most compact ones that we are currently aware of. Maybe future scientists will find ways to store information in subatomic particles. Maybe not. I don't know, so I'm not willing to make absolute statements about it as though I do. It's already a huge problem for evolutionists to explain how these chemical letters could arise spontaneously from right. a so-called primordial soup of non-living chemicals. The exact process by which DNA evolved is unknown, true, but it's not like researchers are completely at a loss here. In 2016, they found that two plausible prebiotic cycles would spontaneously produce nucleobases that would pair off, much in the way that DNA bases do, without having to go through purification first. And the molecules that genetic polymer that's DNA and RNA, are made out of, have been found all over the place in nature, from meteorites to interstellar ice clouds. So clearly, they have no problem forming through natural processes. Each three-letter codon codes for one protein letter called an amino acid, and there are a total of 64 possible codons, but there are only 21 different amino acids coding for proteins. There are 22, not 21. And the amino acids are not coding for proteins, that's the genetic molecule's job. They are what physically make up the proteins. There are also hundreds of amino acids that exist in nature that aren't used by life, and there's no reason why a genetic code could not have developed that uses different amino acids than the ones that we use. Hell, there's no reason to even think that DNA and RNA are the only possible genetic molecules. Scientists have been able to create synthetic genetic molecules, known as XNAs, with various different components. Some could plausibly develop naturally, others likely would not. And of the ones that could develop naturally, a few, such as peptide nucleic acid, or PNA, could work as a prebiotic genetic molecule on Earth. 
as in before life developed, there could have been PNA molecules performing the precursor jobs to what DNA and RNA do now, and it has been found to stably interact with both DNA and RNA, so it is entirely possible for the modern genetic molecules to have evolved from PNA as a precursor molecule. And with the use of these XNA molecules, they were, in some cases, able to use what are called non-canonical amino acids as part of the protein building process. The implication here being that R22 amino acids were not a foregone conclusion. Life could very plausibly have developed to use other amino acids in other combinations, and with how many hundreds of amino acids that are known to exist, there are a mind-bogglingly large number of possible ways that these acids could be used by biochemistry to make proteins. Given this, the fact that life on Earth settled on 22 seems like nothing more than a fluke. Well, this means that more than one codon can be used for any particular amino acid. Yeah, but why so much duplication? As, as cells divide and DNA gets copied, copying errors or mutations occur. Sometimes letters get put in the wrong place, but this apparent duplication means that in many cases, one letter can get changed and still result in the production of the correct amino acid. And that is brilliant engineering by the creator god of the Bible. Couple things here. First, brilliant engineering would be to not make such replication errors possible in the first place, rather than having a protective mechanism that doesn't always work properly. You could still have your adaptability through genetic diversity. Creationists say that all adaptability was built into the chromosomes of the first created organisms, and natural selection worked in different environments to favor traits that already had genetic material coding for them. This is demonstrably false, but if we pretend that it's true, then there's no reason for a mutation to happen at all. So the fact that God designed the genetic code to be partially protected against mutations means that God was unable to design one that would be fully protected, or that he was unable to design DNA in a way that wouldn't produce errors in the first place. But secondly, and more importantly, mathematical modeling has shown that not only are there a myriad of other potential genetic codes that are possible, but that many of these would actually do a better job at protecting against mutations than the one that we ended up with. So even if designing it that way was a feat of brilliant engineering on God's part, it wasn't the best that it could be. You may have heard about the infamous Miller-Urey experiment back in 1953, in which electricity was added to certain gases under specialized conditions. This was intended to show how life could spontaneously arise without God. Right. No, that's not it at all. You know you can, like, read the original publication, right? It's not hard to find. For fuck's sake, just read the damn title! A Production of Amino Acids Under Possible Primitive Earth Conditions. The experiment was meant to test the hypothesis that organic compounds that serve as the basis of life were formed when the Earth had an atmosphere of methane, ammonia, water, and hydrogen. That's literally the first sentence of the paper! There is nothing about God in the paper at all, nothing about religious implications, nor did they ever claim to be attempting to create life in the experiment. They were simply looking to show that amino acids could form naturally, and they not only were successful in that endeavor, but plenty of research since then has shown that amino acid formation is relatively simple for nature, as, like nucleobases, amino acids have been found in both interstellar space and in meteorites. But the experiment actually showed that it took a great deal of intelligence to set up conditions that produce mostly a lot of tar and just a few amino acids. Yeah. So are you going to address the fact that naturally occurring amino acids have been found in interstellar space and meteorites? That's not a new discovery, you should be aware of it by now. Or even just address the fact that organic tar is a very plausible starting point for prebiotic chemistry. So tar and a few amino acids shows a plausible pathway to the eventual development of life. And yeah, the experiment was designed by people, but it was designed to mimic what were thought at the time to be conditions of the prebiotic Earth. It's not like they just cooked up some amino acids and then said, hey, because we made amino acids, nature can too! They specifically designed the experiment to mimic what would happen in nature without the influence of a designer. This is a long way from a living cell. Yeah, it is. What's wrong with that? They weren't aiming for living cell, they were aiming for amino acids. And they got amino acids. Yeah, here are some of the problems with that experiment. First, there were starting assumptions about what gases would have been present on the primordial Earth, and these didn't include oxygen, which tends to destroy chemical bonds, preventing anything from forming. Now, since then, evidence indicates that oxygen likely was present at the time. Oops. Sure, fine, whatever. But again, I'm left wondering, 
Who fucking cares? Why are we picking on an experiment from the 1950s as though that were the definitive model of how abiogenesis happened? Like, seriously, just read the goddamn Wikipedia page on the Miller-Urey experiment. There's a whole section called Related Experiments and Follow-Up Work. Just from reading that section, I can tell you that a 1961 experiment produced nucleobases and amino acids, a 1963 experiment produced RNA and DNA nucleobases, in the late 70s and early 80s experiments began using UV photolysis and including oxygen as part of the simulated atmosphere, a 1978 experiment yielded various alcohols, aldehydes, and organic acids, Carl Sagan himself even got involved showing that complex organic solids could be produced from molecules that are abundant in interstellar gas clouds. Miller himself went on to repeat the experiment with a variety of different simulated atmospheres, showing that it still worked even under different conditions, including ones that contained oxygen. Also worth mentioning is that the amount of oxygen contained in the prebiotic atmosphere is described as vanishingly low amounts. So while this does impact the chemistry a bit, it's by no means a deal breaker. So because it didn't accurately simulate the Earth's atmosphere, it's, it's pretty much irrelevant as an experiment, and those amino acids could not have formed. Yeah, I guess they are just going to ignore the fact that amino acids can and do form naturally, as indicated by their presence in interstellar clouds and in meteorites, as well as the more than seven decades of research that is built on the original Miller-Urey experiment. Like, for fuck's sake, I currently have a copy of a magazine from 1952 that has an advertisement on the back explaining that throat specialists recommend smoking camels. Science wasn't exactly at its peak in the 1950s, so why are you pretending like an experiment from the 1950s somehow proved that evolution can't happen because they got the composition of the atmosphere wrong, rather than addressing the follow-up research that shows that the conclusion of the original experiment holds true even if the details of the atmosphere were wrong? Not only that, many molecules required for life exist in two forms that look like mirror images of each other, like your left and right hands. This is called chirality, from the Greek word for hand. The Miller-Urey experiment produced equal amounts of left and right-handed forms of amino acids. Yeah, but all amino acids and proteins are left-handed, while all sugars in DNA and RNA and in metabolic pathways are right-handed. Random chemical reactions won't produce 100% left-handed right. amino acids that are needed for life. Two words. Asymmetric autocatalysis. That is a whole category of reactions where a chiral product catalyzes a reaction that involves achiral molecules to produce more of itself in the same chiral configuration. This is just one example of thousands where evolutionists have major problems explaining how life originated. Yeah. And given that you've likely decided to go with your strongest example, then it stands to reason that this is actually just one example of thousands where you are completely ignorant of the scientific literature on the subject, with the other examples somehow managing to be worse than this one. But evolution continues to be promoted as established scientific fact. Because it is. Going back to your first segment on irreducible complexity, do you know what Michael Behe, the guy who coined the term irreducible complexity, says about evolution? Quote, I am not a creationist and have no reason to doubt common descent. In fact, my own views fit quite comfortably with the 40% of scientists that Scott acknowledges think evolution occurred but was guided by God. Scott in this case being Eugenie Scott of the National Center for Science Education. When the people you get your anti-evolution arguments from say point blank that they are not creationists and that there is no reason to doubt common descent, then can you really say that those arguments actually support your anti-evolution position? I'm skipping the next bit because these guys take a really long time to say almost nothing, so I'll summarize it for you. They describe Haldane's dilemma, also known as the wait time problem. Oversimplified, it's basically that a mutation can either be beneficial or deleterious, and in order for evolution to favor the beneficial over the deleterious, the beneficial mutations have to happen at a more frequent rate than they do, and then spread through the population faster than they do. This problem was based on the calculations of J.B.S. Haldane in 1957, and as with the Miller-Urey experiment, you have to ignore several decades of research in order to present this as a significant problem for evolution. Most notably, Motu Kimura pretty much solved the problem in his Neutral Theory of Mutations in 1968, where, as it turns out, most mutations are mostly neutral, rather than being either beneficial or deleterious. Since only 2% of human DNA codes for proteins, it was assumed that the other 98% was non-functional and was eventually labeled junk DNA. Yeah. This appeared to solve the problem since there could be all kinds of neutral mutations in the junk DNA with no significant damage to the organism. Actually, yes, 
your percentage is off, but that's essentially what Motu Kimura's paper pointed out. While a bunch of non-coding DNA does serve some function, usually regulatory in nature, there must be a large portion of the genome that is entirely without function. Now, there are several variables that impact the mutation rate in humans, and different parts of the genome have different mutation rates, so when researchers set out to calculate how much of the genome had to be devoid of function, they provided a wide range of estimates for the average mutation rate, covering two orders of magnitude of the potentially different rates. Then they calculated how many babies the average person would have to have in order to generate enough genetically healthy babies that would be able to grow up and have babies of their own in order to replace themselves. And when looking at actual historical data, this rate tends to hover between 1 and 1.75. So for the purposes of being extremely conservative with their estimates, they decided to settle on 2 as the maximum. Given this information, it is not possible for more than 15% of the human genome to be in any sense functional. At least 85% of it has to be junk in order for mutational load to not kill us off in a matter of a few generations. As can be seen on this table showing their calculated results for the various different potential scenarios, if we instead stick with a replacement rate of 1.75, which is a closer fit with the actual historical data, then a maximum of 10% can be functional. And keep in mind, we're not talking protein coding here, we're talking any function whatsoever. Junk DNA was not just an arbitrary label, it was mathematically necessary for evolution to occur. No, it's not mathematically necessary for evolution to occur, it's mathematically necessary for humanity to continue existing for more than just a handful of generations. If we assume that the genome is 80% functional, as is often claimed, then with the lowest estimated mutation rate, every couple would have to have 102 children in order for two of them to survive and reproduce. This, somewhat obviously, does not correspond to reality. If it did, it wouldn't take long at all for humanity to go extinct. Even at just 15% functional, every couple would have to have four to five kids just for the population to remain stable. But given that historically the rate hovered somewhere between two and four, it doesn't really make sense for the functional portion of the genome to be more than 10%. Hell, even if we go with the stereotype of a 1700s farming family and say that each couple had 10 kids, that still leaves us with a maximum of a 30% functional genome, assuming the lowest possible mutation rates. But situations like that are actually outliers. All evidence points to human fertility rates being relatively low for most of our history. Evolution be damned, we're just talking about keeping the human population constant here. Yeah, and this led to an unfortunate lack of research into the majority of the genome. Yeah. Junk DNA was assumed to be a result of evolution by mutation and was then used as proof of evolution. It's a bit of circular yeah. reasoning there. I don't know how you define almost no research, but a quick search on Google Scholar for non-coding region yielded over 1.8 million results, and a search for junk DNA came back with nearly 80,000 results. That seems like quite a bit more than almost none. And on top of that, the first result for junk DNA, a paper called The Case for Junk DNA, actually points out that as genetic sequencing technology advances and becomes more accessible, the interest in exploring the non-coding regions of the genome is growing. Their main problem seems to be with the fact that discussions about the newly discovered functional portions of a genome will often begin with a statement about how most of the genome has been previously dismissed as useless junk, before going on to describe the newly discovered function, when that is an oversimplification at best. Like okay. vestigial organs. Yes. About a hundred years ago, there were around a hundred body parts labeled vestigial. No one knew what these parts were for, so they were assumed by evolutionists to be leftovers or vestiges from a previous stage in human evolution. They were then used as evidence for evolution. This hindered research into these organs for many years. But guess what? Almost all of those vestigial organs have since been found to have a purpose, as if they were designed. Nice. Shit like this actually makes me really angry. There is no way these guys haven't been told a million times by now that vestigial does not mean without function. Evolution works largely through repurposing already existing material. So take my appendix, for example. Please take it, it's inflamed, I don't need it anymore. We know that it's a vestigial remnant of our herbivorous ancestors' digestive systems that help with the digestion of tough plant matter. It no longer does that, but it does currently harbor a sampling of your gut bacteria, and can keep them safe even if you get an illness like dysentery which can clear out most of your gut bacteria in fairly short order. So it acts as a sort of safe haven for them, so that once you get better, they can repopulate your gut. 
The fact that we found this purpose does not negate the fact that it is an evolutionary remnant of our herbivorous past. And you guys repeating the false claim that any purpose means it isn't vestigial only serves to set your audience up for a rude awakening when they learn that you are wrong. Though, to be fair, I'm not sure why this one bothers me more than any of the other wrong things they've said so far. Maybe it's because it's actually difficult to understand things like the evolutionary history of ATP synthase, but the basics of vestigial organs are pretty simple. Or maybe it's because they just essentially made the exact same argument as that guy that I responded to ages ago, who clearly didn't have a fucking clue what he was talking about. But he was very smug in his ignorance. When a scientist who is an evolutionist or an atheist, comes across an organ in a creature that they don't immediately know what the function of it is, instead of just spending more time and effort researching the organ to see if there actually is a function to it or not, they get lazy and sloppy in their work and they arbitrarily declare the organ to be leftover junk from the evolutionary process, and they put it on that shelf over there. Sure, they said it with more charisma than he did, but the substance of the argument was exactly the same. That guy is what happens to the lay people who get their scientific information from creationist sources. They end up believing what are fairly obvious lies about science and how science operates, which then makes them look really bad for having trusted you. And I think that's really what gets me. If I had just been a little bit less curious about science than I am, I could have gone down that path and ended up sounding like I didn't have a clue what I was talking about. Because I believed the misconceptions that creationists actively encourage their flock to believe, even if they themselves wouldn't say it in exactly the same way. You say, the labeling of organs as vestigial sets research back decades as scientists failed to examine the function of those organs. The lay people hear, scientists are lazy and rather than put effort into figuring stuff out, they throw the label vestigial on it and then put it on that shelf, never to be looked at again. File it away and never deal with it again. And you know better than that, you just don't care. Fearfully and <laughs> wonderfully made. I love it when science catches up with the Bible. Yeah, it's the same with junk DNA. Evolutionist assumptions hindered research. It, it, it took a while, but in 2003, finally, the ENCODE project, which stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, began uh, uh, studying just 1% of the human genome, including areas that did and did not code for protein. Why do you say finally like that? The human genome wasn't completely sequenced for the first time until 2003. And 2003 is when the ENCODE project began trying to figure out what all the various functions for the genes were. That sounds pretty damn quick, if you ask me. ENCODE was actually the direct successor to the Human Genome Project. They didn't publish until 2013, but given that it originally took from 1990 to 2003 to sequence the genome, that seems like a reasonable time frame. Also, with regards to scientists not wanting to look into junk DNA, thus causing our understanding of the genome to stagnate, to quote the authors of a 2014 paper that points out some of the key problems with the ENCODE project, it is simply not true that non-coding DNA has long been dismissed as worthless junk and that functional hypotheses have only recently been proposed, despite the frequency with which this cliché is repeated in media reports and in the introductions of far too many scientific studies. And they come with references, going back as far as the 1950s of papers trying to figure out the function of non-coding regions of the genome. They found that 80% of so-called junk DNA has a function. Wow. Who knew? <laughs> Not quite. They claimed that 80% of human DNA sequences exhibit a biochemical function. The differences here are subtle, but it does matter. Well, at least, to those of us who aren't actively trying to perpetuate misinformation, it matters. This also caused quite a bit of a kerfuffle in the biologist community when it came out, because, as it turned out, ENCODE's definition of what counted as functional was so loose that, again to quote the 2014 paper, such permissive criteria will identify a great many genetic elements regardless of whether they have been under selective pressure or contribute to any meaningful organism level capacities. And then, from the conclusion of that paper, ENCODE misapplied this definition of function by using criteria that were far too broad. And that's the paper that was being nice. To quote the mean one, according to the ENCODE consortium, a biological function can be maintained indefinitely without selection, which implies that at least 70% of the genome is perfectly invulnerable to deleterious mutations, either because no mutations can ever occur in these functional regions, or because no mutation in these regions can ever be deleterious. This absurd conclusion was reached through various means, chiefly by employing the seldom used causal role definition of biological function and then applying it inconsistently to different biochemical properties, by committing a lot 
biological fallacy known as affirming the consequent, by failing to appreciate the crucial difference between junk DNA and garbage DNA, by using analytical methods that yield biased errors and inflate estimates of functionality, by favoring statistical sensitivity over specificity, and by emphasizing statistical significance rather than the magnitude of the effect. So no, despite ENCODE's claim to the contrary, 80% of the human genome is not functional in any meaningful sense. Human DNA codes in not just one, not two, not three, but four dimensions. I mean, unless you mean something other than the fact that it's a three-dimensional molecule that exists in time, that's kind of a well-duh statement. A few years ago, researchers compared the relatively simple E. coli genome with the Linux operating system. The E. coli genome uses a few high-level instructions that control a few mid-level processes that in turn control a massive number of protein coding genes. Linux is much more top-heavy and thus much less efficient. E. coli can do a lot more with fewer controls. Now, y'all are completely misrepresenting this. First, the green lines at the bottom of the E. coli chart are not the protein coding genes. They are nodes of the transcriptional regulatory network that have zero out degree. The top yellow line are the nodes with zero in degree, and the purple in the middle are nodes that have a mix of both. Protein coding genes are located in all three levels. In degree is how many regulators call that node, and out degree is how many target genes or functions are called by that node. So for a genome, if a gene is activated by another gene, that counts for its in degree score, and a gene that does the activating of another gene gets a point for its out degree score. And for the operating system, a function is a self-contained bit of code that performs a specific task. When another bit of code activates that function, that counts for its in degree. And the code that does the activating gets a point for its out degree. Now, I confess that I'm at a bit of a loss in figuring out an easy to understand biological example, but for programming, I have a script running that when I click my mouse wheel, it'll open a menu listing folders that I frequently access. When I click one, it'll check to see if that folder is already open, and if it is, it'll bring it into focus. If it's not, it opens it. Checking to see if a particular folder is already open is a job that I need the script to do repeatedly every time I select one of the menu items. So rather than have the same code with minor variations copied over and over again throughout the code that defines the menu, I have a function called open or activate folder, which can be given a path of whatever folder I'm looking to open, and then it'll do what I need it to do before exiting. There are 12 places in my code that could potentially call the open or activate folder function, so its in degree is 12. That function itself calls three three other functions, so its out degree is 3. Since it is both called by other pieces of code and itself calls other pieces of code, it would be in the middle purple section of the chart. So those of you who are at least somewhat familiar with programming will now perfectly understand why the purple is the biggest line in the graph, most functions call other functions and are themselves called by other functions, but you may also be wondering about the fact that they're talking about the Linux call graph as though it shows less evidence of design than the E. coli transcriptional regulatory network. But the nodes that they've dubbed the workhorses in the paper are the ones that are called by other nodes but do not do any calling themselves. And from an operating system standpoint, that will be the highest level functions that are used to control basically everything else. But the CMI guys have it labeled as though the yellow nodes that are doing all the calling are the high level functions, while the green nodes are the outputs. And yes, you're right. They have this chart completely backward. They appear to have just looked at it, thought that the E. coli part of it looked tidier, and decided to just call that evidence of design. But if we read the actual paper, instead of just looking at the graph and trying to make it fit what they want to say instead of what it actually says, we see that they say, the process of biological evolution via random mutation and subsequent selection tightly constrains the evolution of regulatory network hubs. The call graph, however, exhibits rapid evolution of its highly connected generic components made possible by designers' continual fine-tuning. Despite the E. coli chart appearing to be tidier, the tight constraints that give it the tidy appearance are a direct result of evolution, while the top-heavy appearance of the Linux call graph is a result of it being intelligently designed for cost-effectiveness. I am now skipping a rather large chunk of this section. Their DNA operates in four dimensions thing is basically just, here's four things that can impact how genes are transcribed and translated, along with a bunch of, wow, isn't that complicated? interjections. It's quite dull, and if you're interested in things like how a gene's physical position in the chromosome can impact its expression, or how the transcription of a protein doesn't happen in a linear fashion, but with bits and pieces of the DNA spliced together using introns and exons, or anything else about DNA, there are way better places to learn it than from these jokers.
Wow, we covered quite a bit today. But Yes, uh, we certainly did. Anyways, we'll <laughs> see you next week. Whoopsie daisies. I just accidentally skipped 10 minutes of their video and ended up at the very end. Oh, well. You didn't miss much. It was literally just 10 minutes of them going, wow, that is so complex. No way that could be the result of random chance, while explaining various scientific findings. And given how poorly they interpreted other papers, I am incredibly doubtful that their explanations were even close to accurate. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from my 1952 edition of Look Magazine. Okay, I'm not actually responding to a comment in this magazine, but I bought this when I was scripting a response to Deflate a couple of weeks ago. It's the article where the claim that there are over 50,000 errors in the Bible comes from, and as I had gathered from other sources reporting on it, it does essentially amount to the same points that are frequently made about biblical manuscripts. That there were a bunch of scribal errors, and we know of several stories that were inserted into the text after the fact, like the ending of Mark and the story of the woman caught in adultery, for example. But it might not have been a complete waste of money. I'm going to see about scanning it, and there's a couple articles that I might want to cover, depending on how interesting they are. There's one called We're Losing the Battle Against Sin, and another called Are U.S. Teenagers Rejecting Freedom? This might be the kind of stuff I'd rather cover on the watering hole, but from the headlines, it seems like the culture war fear-mongering hasn't really changed all that much over the years. Though, I also might decide to just read through some of the letters to the editor, because this issue seems to have followed an issue that ran an article that was critical of the Jim Crow laws. And from reading the letters to the editor, everyone back then, except for Meredith Ann Johnson from Reno, was a racist motherfucker. Good on you, Meredith. I also completely forgot about the existence of that um, unfortunately named weight loss product, so I was rather taken aback when I turned the page and saw AIDS helps me lose weight and feel better too. And really, my favorite part of all this is that I now have an official business receipt that I will use to deduct the cost of this magazine on my taxes, which describe it as Look Magazine, February 26, 1952, cute young woman in curious red and white striped exercise leotard, good condition. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I live stream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern and with my partner every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorships manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Gene Moren and all the rest, who are the complications that conclusively demonstrate the evolutionary history of my channel. If you'd like these two to look at you and say, wow, must have been God, then you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! Hello. Face is here. Hello. There we go. Intro. This is going to be one of those videos. Why are you focusing on not me? I am the star. Let's take a look. It's in a book. A reading rainbow. I can't do anything. Electrons seeking a lower energy state. <laughs> snuck out of there. Then congratulations, you've noticed it. You've noticed it. Form rather easily in the right comical, comical, comical environments. I'm here to buy some conicals. I would like comicals, please. We know that it's a vestigial remnant of our herbivor- our herbivorous, 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 our herbivorous. Lossing with the R herbivorous, R herbivorous, R herbivorous, R herbivorous, R herbivorous. God damn, and now you decide to fucking tablet. I need a new goddamn tablet. I need a lot of new things. There's an Amazon wish list. There's not a tablet on it though. I should probably do that. It's because I don't know. I need a I need a fucking ox. Headphone jack. Yes, this is me sneakily asking you to buy stuff off my wish list in the outtakes because I'm bad at doing that in an actual video. So the five of you that watch this all the way through can uh, not buy me shit because it's only expensive shit that's on there right now. <laughs>
DNA, by the way, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid.